going to be a brief overview of like an isometric training, um, some of my thoughts on it as well. Um, I think it's about, about 10 slides, and then we're just going to open it up to the floor. Um, you know, Dan Lawrence is on here. Dan does a lot of kind of isometric training with his bo uh, boxers and athletes. Uh, we've got uh, Gary Oak from GB Boxing. He's got some thoughts around isometric training as well. So, you know, I want to kind of open it up and, and pick their brains as well. So then it's, you know, it's extending all our, our learning and, and knowledge and understanding of this subject. So just put this in, uh, just as a definition, most of you know what an isometric contraction is, uh, what isometric training is. Uh, basically, still producing force, uh, still contracting the muscle, but your body isn't moving. It's about as simple as that. And there's two types of um, isometrics that we're going to be talking about uh, within this presentation. And if anybody's got any other kind of types of isometric training that they want to mention, um, just, just open it up in the chat. So the first one is overcoming isometrics, which is where it, probably the most common and most relevant um, type of isometric for kind of strength, speed, sports, and you know, our sport, boxing and MMA. So this is where uh, the force is developed with intent to overcome that external force, working against like a movable object, such as like a, a squat rack, or if the weight's uh, too heavy for you. Um, you know, mainly you want to make sure that that weight is pinned down, because even like in, in this example here, where we've got uh, Fowler doing the, um, the isometric hip thrust, uh, we have Jordan, it's, it's a bit of a beast, you know, but uh, Jordan was still like kind of lifting it just off the um, squat rack. So we're having to, me and Tommy were having to kind of push it down on, on either side to make sure that it was like locked down and you weren't going to move it. Um, suppose, I don't know whether that's him just being super strong or just super determined. Um, I think that's a combination of the both. But the main adaptations from this is to increase rate of force development and also activates and develops the fast twitch muscle fibers. Uh, even though it's not a, a fast and dynamic movement, we're still um, activating and developing them fast twitch muscle fibers. Um, how to perform? This is just like a, a, a rough overview. There's lots of different ways that you can uh, perform this. You can perform it for like uh, two seconds, you can go six seconds, but the general thing is to go for th anywhere between three and five second holds with a short recovery and you do anywhere between three and five repetitions. And then you normally do around about um, like four to five uh, sets of that. And then you can go at different levels as well. So you've got like low, mid, or like kind of high points of the lift. You've got yielding isometrics. So this is where you perform the movement and then you hold it within a position on the eccentric uh, to maintain position. So I've used this shot of Jordan. Uh, it's not actually doing um, yielding isometrics here. It's just him halfway up, halfway up a deadlift, but kind of getting into this position and holding it. And this will kind of help increase uh, eccentric strength, but it'll also increase like the time under tension. And this will help um, stimulate mTOR signaling pathways that will uh, increase muscle protein synthesis, that can help um, improve muscular strength and hypertrophy as well. So how to perform, you perform slowly descending uh, on a submaximal load uh, towards like the midpoint, or you can go towards like uh, the bottom point. So I've seen, seen like videos of like squats holding it at the, at the bottom of the squat and then kind of uh, being lifted up from there. But mainly, you want it to work towards that midpoint. And I've seen like so many different variations of this, but my general understanding of this is that you hold it anywhere between 20 and 60 seconds. Some mad guys go for two minutes, uh, but also it can be done like kind of on a rep by rep basis. So like holding it for about um, like three, three to five seconds on the way down 
holding it within that uh, midpoint, coming down and then lifting back up. But yeah, there's loads of different ways that you can do yielding isometrics. There's loads of stuff um, out there. And I've come across some like articles like doing this uh, presentation and I'll sh be sharing uh, that kind of information with you uh, within that group chat that we've got. So why can this uh, benefit boxing? We've gone through, like, let, let me just talk, really looking at, looking at these different types, I would be looking to do overcoming isometrics for boxing. Um, so this is what I've kind of talked about on the, on the like preceding slides um, of, of the benefits, the limitations and the practical recommendations as well. You look at that, really it's, it's, it's stimulating muscle protein synthesis um, which will in turn can increase muscular strength but also it's signaling pathways for, for hypertrophy as well and this is something that we kind of want to um, avoid especially with athletes that are quite close to the weight so I wouldn't necessarily do yielding isometrics uh, within a normal training camp um, however if we're working with an athlete that is uh, injured or in off season or is looking to work up uh, the, the weight categories or looking to try and put on some muscle mass, this is a, a good kind of training method uh, to use because you're not only going to be increasing uh, muscle mass, but you're going to be doing it in the right way. You're going to be developing them fast switch muscle fibers. You're not just doing it, doing rep after rep after rep going slow grinding out the movement um, this is probably a, a good way to build uh, functional mass but i would go for overcoming isometrics and that's what most of us are using at the minute the reason why uh, it's going to be beneficial for boxing we talked about it uh, increasing rate of force development this is what we want to improve uh, because this transfers to fast and explosive punches it limits the eccentric stress. So when we're working on, on maximal lifts, such as like heavy trap bar deadlifts or heavy squats, there is some eccentric stress to this. And this is something that they don't particularly want during, um, during a training camp when they've got um, high calorie deficits. Um, they've got high training loads, they don't want to be sore the next day. But also it can be a limiting factor to how much weight they can lift. Um, I did, if some of you are part of the Boxing Science membership, just done a, um, a thing on um, partial range lifts for boxing and looked at the velocities lifted doing the partial range lifts compared to um, compared to the actual um, lifts. Um, and the one guy that I uh, like kind of noted out on that presentation was Vlad Mate, who's um, a very explosive athlete, but he's got very limited eccentric control. And you can see that in kind of every kind of like loaded jump he does, uh, unloaded jump and his kind of movement jump testing as well. And you saw like a massive difference between when he's got an eccentric action involved with his, within his squat and when that eccentric is taken away and it's concentric only and he's, and, and he's got the biggest difference between velocities on, uh, on the partial range lift, concentric only, to the full range lift. So not only do we want to reduce the eccentric stress because it makes our athletes sore, but also... Um, Taking away this eccentric stress will kind of improve that kind of force production as well. I hope that made sense. I felt like I was rambling a little bit there. Um, increases effective mass. So whole body tension at the end of the punch. If you're familiar with boxing science, you'll have seen this in a lot of our presentations. We want to try and increase the amount of tension at the end of the punch all the way through the lower body, core and upper body. It's increasing that snap for when we're in contact with our opponent or on the pads or the bags and then uh, complex training so we can help increase uh, through doing isometrics overcoming isometrics can increase 
uh, muscle activation, which will uh, greater percentage of uh, regulatory uh, light chain phosphorylation. Got a, that's my mouthful. Uh, and greater changes in muscle architecture. So basically, this will can help potentiating responses for the fast and explosive exercises. So when we're looking at improving strength speed, speed strength and that explosiveness as well, we're looking for every percentage possible to make sure that our athlete is in the best shape possible when they're entering the ring on fight night. So using like some sort of isometric training uh, can be useful in creating potentiating responses and can be uh, used as part of contrast or complex training. So here are the uh, considerations and limitations of using isometrics within boxing. And this is, this is my um, kind of personal reflections on the athletes that I've worked with. Uh, some of you might find that there's no kind of limitations uh, whatsoever and see it as a really useful tool. But these are some of the uh, observations I've taken when uh, working with athletes and trying out isometrics with them. Uh, the main thing is, is activation patterns, you know, they're tight and overactive in areas uh, and th these will look to try and take over when they're trying to produce that maximum force. So uh, Tommy mentioned in the group chat the other day, talking about um, activation patterns and would we use uh, isometrics with somebody that has got poor activation pattern. I know a lot of athletes that will look to use their lower back when they're like going through maximum lifts and I wouldn't use um, isometrics with them. Um, mid thigh pulls, um, these are um, you know, very well renowned within isometrics uh, and isometric training. However, what I've found is that they, they, they start feeling like a lot of muscle activation in their back. They also try and yank it with their arms a lot and they can see like kind of them struggling with their, with their posture. So, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a few slides time. But yeah, that's what, what I've generally found is that the poor activation patterns um, has affected their ability to do this safely and effectively. Also with that is the limited experience in maximum strength training. It, I always talk about kind of unlocking um, their kind of force production qualities through using different kind of exercises, such as using the partial range lifts, getting them used to uh, lifting a heavier load. More often than not, once I do like a, a super maximal block, when I return to max strength training, they're able to lift more from the floor just because we've kind of unlocked their kind of, um, their force producing uh, potential. That's very bad science, but that's what I'm <laughs> trying to get across. So with, them having limited experience in maximum strength training will limit their aware awareness of like kind of producing maximum force, uh, using the right muscle groups, being able to drive through that floor as well. Um, so yeah, so they, this can only um, affect of the, obviously the, the safety as aspect, but optimizing that production. If we're wanting to increase race the force development, we need to get them to push against that bar or pull the bar as fast and as hard as possible. And if they're not trained and able to do that, then you're kind of wasting that training time. And then uh, true max efforts. How do we know that we are getting that maximum effort out of them? When we've got limited feedback, how are maximum efforts achieved? Um, we are very fortunate at Sheffield Army University to have access to force plates, but it takes a lot of time to get them uh, set up, get them in place, getting the data, uh, analyzing that data and giving the, the athletes the feedback as well. So not many times where we'll get the force plates out and we've actually got access to that. So a lot, lot of you that kind of listen to this will not have access to uh, force plates. So how can we determine whether uh, they're actually producing that maximum effort every single rep. 
So here are my kind of practical recommendations, thinking about them considerations. Um, first of all, carefully select the exercises. So I would go kind of like at the midpoint, I wouldn't go too low because of, um, because of kind of mobility issues. I've been thinking about that length tension relationship. I would go mostly uh, at the midpoint. I'd also look to, in, instead of like doing the straight bar, I like the trap bar variation of it, where we're working against the racks, just because we're sitting them shoulders in a better position, we're keeping that posture nice and strong. And then I prefer like doing like kind of the loaded hip thrust. I think uh, taking your arms out of the equation is, is important because like I said, they, they look to try and pull it and using that upper body. Whereas if we're looking to improve the hip extension, the hip extension forces, I think using the, the loaded uh, isometric hip thrust would be a preferred option. Also doing the, doing the squat as well, but what you've got to be mindful of there is the amount of loading going through the spine. Obviously you've got to train uh, the athletes up to that and being it, making sure that they're competent at doing that. Like I said there, building the foundations, I look to try and increase maximum strength first through traditional training methods, doing heavy trap bar lifts, doing heavy squats and different variations of that, making sure they're doing partial range lifts as well. And then when we've kind of maxed out their uh, max strength, when they're strong enough, I would look to try and do some, some things different. And then uh, if you've got, get some sort of feedback or alter your use of it. So if you don't have access to platform, force platforms or weighing scales, so I'll, we'll, we'll talk to Tommy about uh, using weighing scales because I know that he's uh, been um, experimenting with, with different things. But if you use that weighing scales, you can see how much force that you put in uh, through the floor. If you haven't got access to them, then you won't be able to assess that maximum effort. So alter the use of them. And they can be used as great potentiation tools in warm-ups or using it as, as complex training or contrast training. Uh, these are some practical recommendations. Again, uh, making sure that cue activation patterns, not only from the short term, but long term as well. So you can see there, this is my favorite picture of me and Tommy, me prodding his backside. <laughs> um, I've got a dodgy look on my face as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, cute. So, so if you've seen this video um, or come, come onto the workshop, um, basically what I'm doing there with Tommy is um, cueing that his glutes are ten tensing and firing up first and ma uh, making like, what you see in that kind of clip, in that full clip, is that Tommy were like kind of using his back hamstrings and then glutes. And most boxers, and probably most athletes, will, will look to do that as well, just through kind of what their general training history is like. So making sure that you, you know what kind of activation patterns your athletes uh, are doing, but also training that prior to going into uh, doing some maximal efforts, especially when you're working on hip extensions. Making sure you've got solid coaching cues. So um, using cues such as like drive through the floor or body like concrete or anything that you can use to make sure that they're producing maximum force. So say body like concrete is making sure that basically every single muscle group is tense all the way through that action. And then, making sure that you're getting a proper warm-up in place or periodize it. So you can't expect your athletes to produce maximum force straight away. So use some maximal efforts to warm up, work on like RPE. If you haven't got access to um, uh, weighing scales or, for, or force platforms, you've got, um, you know, RPE rate of uh, perceived exertion. You want to be working six, seven, eight out of 10 nine out of 10 and then working towards your 10 out of 10 and also periodize it as well. You know, if you are working on like, um, if you are wanting somebody to improve their one bet max, you'd periodize them for a number of weeks of working towards that, working 90, 92, 95% one bet max, and then hitting the one, one RM. You wouldn't get them working on like 70% uh, 
80% one met max and then suddenly expected to have a massive jump. So they shouldn't apply within your max uh, in, into um, doing isometrics as well. So you want to kind of use it in a few weeks. If you're looking for that kind of um, uh, max strength and increased rate of force development adaptations, work it for a couple of weeks before where you're working eight out of 10, use it as a warm up tool, get them used to doing it and then actually make it a key part of their program. So using it as assistance, so we've mainly talked about um, isometrics in terms of like trap bar deadlifts, loaded squats, um, you know, we can do bench, bench press as well, but working on them key lifts, but it also can be good for assistance exercises. And these are the, these are the uh, methods that we use at Boxing Science. So we use like core holds, and they, these aren't demonstrated on the pictures, but we either do that to potentiate or strengthen. So we use like manual or wall holds um, to, to help strengthen or fire up the core prior to heavy loaded compound lifts or explosive exercises. So we'll do like kind of put manual uh, pull off holds where we're pushing against them uh, either side on, or we do it like kind of pushing down or pushing up. And this can get their core fired up when they're doing heavy loaded exercises. I mainly do this when they're doing uh, partial range lifts because I want them to make, make sure that their core is, is, is fired up, switched on, ready to contract to make sure that basically uh, making that exercise uh, safer and more effective. And then uh, like kind of doing the pull off holds, doing it like around about 10 seconds and then doing some like kind of um, fast and explosive uh, rotational work with with a med ball or with a band. Do the long mind punch with isometric holes. You'll have seen these if you're a keen follower of boxing science. This will encourage uh, maximal tension and the end range of punching, increasing effective mass. So do between three and five repetitions, uh, three to four sets of this. You see, Alan is is probably doing his one met max trying to keep that bar down because I've punched so hard. Um, <laughs> But yeah, just basically at the end of there, it's pushing against it. I'm holding it for about two to three seconds, tensing up all my core, my, my glutes, uh, my upper arm as well, and really driving against the external force at the end of the punch. And this will look to increase effective mass, increase the snap at the end of the punch. And then you've got punch ISO holds. So I use this in the taper phase um, because like we said about the isometric um, exercises want to kind of warm up warm them up and get them used to doing it but mainly i use it as a warm-up tool um, for like pre-fight or if i win the boxing gym so when i've been on training camp if i'm doing the warm-up i'll finish off with that and basically this is encouraging like that maximal tension and it's firing up all the body ready to increase the snap when they're warming up on the pads i think a, a key thing is we're always looking to optimize performance and you know you want the best possible warm-up for your athlete so when you're going into like kind of doing doing the pad work you want in every single kind of combination on the pad to be executed well and i think like doing the iso holds definitely helps that and you know i've, I've done this with with many athletes and uh, uh, now you know we've got kel book on the screen we also do it with amateurs and I've like kind of received like kind of no complaints of you know I don't want to do that before a fight. They say that it makes them feel good, it makes them feel ready uh, to go onto the pads. Also using it for uh, post activation potentiation. So this is how I'd use it uh, mainly um, at Boxing Science. So I do three, three to four second holds of isometric contractions. Um, I'd limit it to that because if you do too much, it can lead to neuromuscular fatigue and peripheral fatigue as well. So this can potentially over massive potentiating factors. Obviously you want, you, you don't want to understimulate, but also you don't want to fatigue your athlete. And it is trial and error. Uh, I've kind of skipped to skip my second point there, making sure that you're getting that feedback to see whether it's working. Um, you know, using uh, velocity or height uh, feedback and using like um, opt to jump or 
my jump or something like that, or even like a, a mark on the wall to make sure that it is, it is working. Um, if it's not working and if the scores are going down, look to either decrease the rep ranges, decrease the time of isometric holds, or increase the rest time. Um, the second point there is using it with strong and explosive athletes. The effectiveness of potentiating responses will vary between individuals. This is why post activation potentiation, complex training, contrast training is a very complicated and well researched area because there's a lot of contradicting evidence because there's so much variation between athletes and individuals. So, even though I'm giving you this kind of this protocol here, look, a trial and error with it and um, adapt it to, to that individual. So if it's working for one individual, so I've got Anthony Fowler on the screen there, he's very different to Jordan Gill and he's working within the same session. So I might do more reps with Fowler and less rest time than I would do with, with Jordan. So you've got to make sure that the protocol is uh, measured and then it's um, adapted around that individual as well. And then I just want to use isometrics during lockdown because I'm seeing it more and more across Instagram, people doing these uh, towel pulls. Um, I like to do com complex training with it um, because not many will be able to uh, perform maximum efforts, um, especially if you're not there, being able to cue them, to provide them coaching cues as well. Therefore, it might be uh, more beneficial comparing, uh, pairing them up for like complex training. Doing like multi-joint or midpoint movements. So you see there I'm working kind of the, the mid-thigh pull. This will uh, improve the safety and the effectiveness. Also, what you've got to make sure that cueing, especially on the towel work, is that I think that you need to kind of squat into it and then pull up into it. I've seen like a few kind of like just getting into that position and then pulling with their arms. It's very hard, especially if you're standing on a towel to produce that force through the floor, but force through your feet. So I, when I were doing it, I was making sure that I was squatting into it and then pulling up. And then uh, doing some sort of yielding uh, isometrics, but like for non-athletes. So if you've got some clients or Let's say if you've got some uh, footballers or tennis players or whoever you work with, you, you know, a muscular hypertrophy will be beneficial for your athlete. Um, you know, you can use yielding isometrics, but don't be looking to implement too many exercises that can help stimulate um, hypertrophy, especially if you're working with boxers. Because like Lee said the other um, last week, is that these athletes are, have got good genetic qualities and they're not used to being like kind of in this positive energy balance, um, not used to like these, the, this decreased training load. If you suddenly start doing a load of weights and a load of repetitions and high volume, high mechanical tension, they've got, they're going to be bound to put on uh, some muscle. So I did a, a post about it yesterday. Some of you will have seen that. So you've got to be mindful of kind of the exercises that you're putting in there, uh, making sure that you're avoiding muscular hypertrophy. And then that is the end of uh, the presentation. I'm doing some shameless advertising here, but we are doing a free trial on the Boxing Science membership. There's no contract. You can cancel at any time, but if this has been beneficial for you, we've got, uh, I think we've done three presentations on the advanced strength series where I talk about like these different training methods. So uh, partial range lifts, um, accommodating resistance. What else I've done? Not sure. I think I've done, con I think I've done contrast training. I'm not sure. Anyway, <laughs> there's, three, there's three presentations on there um, which you can access. So you've got, it's around about 40 minutes uh, you've got some theory why it's applicable to boxing and also like some practical uh, demonstrations and recommendations as well. So if, if that has been useful for you, 
these different uh, presentations you'll definitely like. Okay. So has anybody got like kind of any uh, questions or discussion points? Yep. Yeah. Dan, Danny, do you mind about that sort of start? Just add, add on a few points because you enjoyed yeah. talking about this with you the other day. Like, um, <clears throat> I think the activation patterns one is is like really really key. And a pal of mine was working at um, a rugby club, and they got um, either four stacks or something similar, in where where whereby like they had force plates which were quite accessible, and they they like I think first second third week of pre season they were getting everyone doing. Um, Mid thigh pulls on the thought on the four stacks, getting a lot of play um, competition, but competition between the players, and um, getting getting basically a leaderboard for for what could you mid thigh pull. And trouble was like these these lads probably hadn't done max jump training for a few months as well. This was like one of the other things, especially in pre season, but um, and and also a little bit unaccustomed to it. And he he said one of the things he noticed that was that anyone that wasn't great through the anterior core. Um, like and, and, and had a bit of um, lower back dominance they were complaining about feeling the lower back a lot the next day from the mid-thigh pull so I think like that like even though we've like used it as examples it's proper real that stuff I think and, um, and another thing um, I, was, I was just going to sort of go, um, <coughs> go on from that and I thought um, Dan, Dan might have some good ideas because uh, I've seen him use these a lot but um, I the, the reason behind sort of like splitting the feet and um, and going into a split squat isometric and you know, I was just wondering like my, my thoughts on sort of why I'd assume that um, it is to occur is almost like the same reason we, we sometimes split our feet when we do a split jerk or um, when we when we do an overhead press if you split your feet it becomes harder to arch your back is um, because you put your sort of um, you've put your you, you lower back in a position where it can't really um, benefit you as much, so it becomes more more about the shoulders to stabilise it. So likewise, to be sub for the feet and putting ground reaction force into the floor, if you split the feet, is that a really good potential to reduce the chances that the lower back takes over and, and also um, basically like stimulate the legs a bit more. And the other thing was, because it's a compromised position, does it overall... Like reduce the ground reaction force, um, which makes it safer. Just, just a point on that. I'll bring Dan in in a second. Um, <coughs> talking about them activation patterns, I remember when I did uh, Lee Ricard's presentation, um, dissertation, sorry, and he was looking at um, EMG on the lower back, hamstrings, and glutes across uh, a range of exercises: squat, RDL and um, loaded hip thrust and I were, I were participant of this study so I got the feedback and I couldn't believe how much I was using my lower back and you know more experienced strength creation coach now than I were then but I was quite an experienced lifter um, you know probably then I lifted a deadlift in straight bar over 200 kilos squatting about 175 on on back squat as well are probably my strongest point and so I was an exper like experience at deadlifting and squatting and doing loaded hip thrust but still within this test I was using my lower back so much so how do we so me knowing what muscles I'm supposed to be activating I'm still doing that so what I'm the the boxers and the combat athletes going to do and before I bring Dan in on that split squat when I was doing the um, that towel workout, I felt it much more safe and more effective when I were doing that in in a split stance going on that single leg. I found it more fatiguing. Um, I was doing, <laughs> doing the ice skaters. It felt like I was like dragging doing leg weights across when I was doing the ice skaters after. Um, but hundred percent, I felt it more in my legs when I did it in split stance. Um, Dan, do you want to uh, come in? Hi right, chaps, great presentation Danny. Cheers mate. Um, yeah we do, so I'll go with Tommy's kind of point there in regards to why we go in kind of a staggered stance, split stance position. So there's a number of reasons. Um, in terms of joint angle specificity Tommy, 
So we're looking at the combat athletes, especially, you know, yes, we're driving, we're trying to drive and recruit high threshold motor units and get more neural, neural based adaptations. But my guys feel more comfortable in that split stance position as well. So again, it's kind of what we spoke about in the last presentation uh, last week, I believe it was, or the week prior, actually, Tommy, after yours was when we're trying to recruit high threshold motor units to optimize, you know, as, as I say, kind of neurological function and um, to improve inter and intramuscular muscular coordination and all, all of these, these benefits that we know that Danny's just presented really well with. If the athlete cannot get into those positions and cannot express that force, you know, with intent, because remember intent drives adaptation. So if they don't feel comfortable in that position, then we're not going to reach the outcome we're looking for anyway, are we? Because they're still trying to learn that pattern. So if I can get them in a more advantageous, optimal position, i.e. in a split stance position for these guys who've been boxing for 12 plus years, then the likelihood of me increasing neural drive is going to be higher. So that's one main reason for me, Tommy, is joint angle specificity. And another one, exactly as, you, uh, as you've alluded to there, is safer, without doubt. You know, you're going to get less shear loading on the spine there. Um, also, you know, the whole saying, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And as much as, uh, you know, Danny sat back there and gave us his PB numbers, uh, which was very, um, very impressive. But, um, you know, maybe take yourself away from that movement. Maybe go back to, you know, your glute ham raises. And this isn't directed at you, Danny. This is just as a generalization. Uh, glute ham raises, back extensions, build up the strength in that posterior chain directly and then maybe go back to you know those big compound lifts if you are feeling your lower back is the weakest link, so to speak. Um, so that would be something I'd probably say on that. Uh, we've we have used overcoming isometrics mainly. Uh, we haven't done so much on the yielding side of things. Um, we've used them for we've actually used them on fight week, funny enough, with John Ryder out in Vegas um, because we didn't want to induce too much peripheral muscular fatigue and soreness. There's a, a good paper, um, I'll, I'll maybe share it with you guys um, uh, later. For 24, 24 hours to 48 hours, you get an increasing rate of force development and, and other kind of neural, neural benefits as well. So we do that as a neural primer on fight week with fighters, some of which don't like it, but others do. And we did that with John and, you know, we, we got a good outcome there um, because, as mentioned, you know, we're not, we're not inducing them from, upon peripheral fatigue. Um, so that worked pretty well for us. We've used it as, as Danny's mentioned there as, you know, as a form of potentiator and primer at the start of a session as well. Um, so we've definitely used it as part of the complex contrast methods, but we've also used it as, for example, if an A1 in our, in our routine might be a trap bar deadlift from the block, you know, heavy. Um, so we then might do prior to that for probably two sets uh, an overcoming ISO in the pin position to replicate joint angle specificity and angle of the main lift, so to speak. So we can prime them in that pattern. And that's worked pretty well for us as well. Um, I'd absolutely agree with the, the durations of, that you said there, Danny. We go up to six seconds of maximal isometric contraction uh, because, again, it goes back to what we're trying to achieve. You know, we're trying to recruit high threshold motor units. We find that anything above six seconds, they're not able to sustain that. Um, so then it becomes, you know, the goal is no longer met, so to speak. Um, and that's, yeah, worked well for us. I think unless you've got force plates, you know, how do you really know? It's a subjective measure, isn't it? You've got to trust your athletes to say, I want you working maximally here. Um, I think this is where a lot of Nick Winkleman's work around cueing can come in. So external cueing can work really well in this instance of, you know, break the bar, bend the pins, you know, put force into the ground, like all, all of that sort of stuff really works. Um, and I think the coach's eye on this, this works better than anything because you know when an athlete is not putting everything into it and you also know when an athlete is. I'll try and um, I'll try and dig out some videos. I've posted quite a bit on this um, around ISIS. I'll do a little post later and you can have a little look at for, for a laugh between us is have a look at the athletes and how, how much they're expressing and the intent that they're using on the uh, exercises because they really are all in on it, you know. Um, so yeah, it's worked pretty well for us. I think stimulate, not annihilate would be another one. We don't want the accumulation of fatigue because again, the, go, the goal is no longer met. Um, yeah, hope that helps. And on on that, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I think I messaged you about this the other month, but um, uh, like we, we were just before we went on lockdown, I did, I did a good play about with this with uh, one of my pals, but um, set up a trap bar um, against pins at about mid thigh um, in a split stance position and put my um, and put my front foot on a set of weighing scales. 
and then pushing down to, into that as hard as I possibly could. I think the intent behind it, like like you said, the, the intent driving adaptation, I think it's massive. And I think that if you've not got knowledge of results in, in something like this, I think you're really limiting the outcome. It's a similar sort of thing to be said for like velocity-based training or something like that. But um, another another guy called uh, Alex Natera, I'm going to sh- share some stuff in his group yeah. after this, but um, he does a bit like athletics have been doing this for years. The the um, the overcoming isometric stuff and in very sort of specific joint angles as well. And one of the things he does to create intent um, it, when he's working with athletics. So, but bear, bearing in mind these are people like very very highly trained people. They've been express a lot of force and they're, they're very highly trained in the weight room as well. So, but he he will get um, for example in a um, so stood on one leg in his sprint stance position with the knee slightly flexed. So that's um, a knee dominant. Um, a knee dominant position, he'll set up a barbell. Um, it, so if he, if he hasn't got force plates, he'll set up a barbell um, against pins. And he'll keep loading up the barbell until they can no longer move it. Um, and it, they want a threshold where they can just about move the barbell and then they know they're getting the intensity. So let's say that athlete can move 280, but as soon as you put 300 on, um, they can't move it. The weight that they're going to put on the bar is 300 and the, the bar might move a tiny bit. And he argues that that is, um, that is a really good way for getting some, some idea of the intent. And you can also auto, sort of auto-regulate it by day. And I think, um, obviously, we've got to be careful doing stuff like that with the boxes, but um, I think it, it gives a really nice indication as to what ways you can create intent and also track progression as well on, the, on these isometrics. Um, and, and, and in that, that sense um, the, the intent being the key driver I think if, you, if you're doing these without some sort of intent then you, you, you are we limiting the effectiveness of them? Yeah I think great point Tommy I think they call that a quasi a quasi isometric as Absolutely. well so it has an element of an eccentric phase uh, it's not a true overcoming iso where you're trying to break, break the pins there is an element of movement there um, but yeah, you're completely right with intent. I think we can take so much from the athletic world. I think Alex and Tara, funny enough, came up in a presentation uh, we did this morning as well, which was which was awesome. He does some great stuff over there in Australia, I believe. Um, also, we did some work with Marvin and Jonas as well at Speedworks, and they do a load of this stuff um, in regards to joint angle specificity. I think what we need to remember, let's bring it back around to boxing, is you've alluded to it there really well, Tom, is these guys have a very high training age. OK, so it doesn't now mean that we all dive in and do a load of isometrics with our guys. We need to we'll get, you know, we've spoken about lowest hanging fruits. We'll get some really good re- results from doing pretty basic work with some of our guys. Obviously, the guys with the kind of moderate to higher training age, we need to be a little bit more intricate in terms of what we're, you know, what we're we're trying to achieve and what we're exposing these athletes to. Um, yeah. I'm, um, I'm going to bring in Gary Hutt. Um Cheers for that discussion, Dan and Tommy. Uh, really good, really insightful. Um, Gary, we're talking about um, you know, adapting to different athletes. And I think at your place, you've got all different shapes and sizes. Um, talk to us about how, how you use it and how, how you can adapt it to, to different athletes. Yeah, well, firstly, like, thanks for that presentation, Dan, because it was quality. And then thanks for the, the chat off the back of it as well there, boys. It was, uh, it was really interesting just to hear your takes on how you're uh, implementing this type of stuff into programming. Um, and I think one of the things, just on touching on what you were discussing there, um, is contextualising where this isometric training sits within a programme. It's like we talk about it as almost separate, but actually I think it's a really valuable point just to highlight that it's, is absolutely max balls out effort. So if we're if we're put, thinking of it like that in terms of intent, we need to be bracketing the same way as we would do with our max max strength lifts and our our one RM type training. And I think I find just generally if we're if we're positioning it in that way, it allows everybody to kind of think about it in an appropriate way to apply. Um, but also then allows you to think about the periodization options you've got in terms of where the different isometrics fit in the uh, in the program so it's really interesting Dan just while you're doing your presentation um, around the overcoming and yielding it's almost like it maps across a periodization block where we're almost looking for mechanical adaptation at the start of a, a training camp potentially and then we're building into that kind of reduced peripheral fatigue into kind of more 
high level neural stimulation towards the end of a camp potentially and into competition. Um, and I just think it's, it's a really interesting discussion around what you guys have been saying about how you can apply that into a bigger context. Um, yeah, going on to your question, Dan, like we're dealing with 45 athletes on the GB program now. So we've got, um, uh, different levels of podium, podium potential, and we've got a women's development program that are involved. All of those guys are different shapes, different sizes, different styles, and the style impacts heavily on how we try and deliver the training that they're doing. Um, but we're also fortunate that we have got force plates thrown into the floor in, in one of the, the, the platforms in the gym, so we can jump on them within two seconds and get all of this information at the touch of a touch of a button. Um, now, I sat back and thought about how we use different isometrics in our programming, um, and I think we've used it in a couple of different ways. We, I think everybody overlooks a few different isometrics, like um, the yield, we're talking about yielding yesterday, Dan, and thinking about oh, how it perhaps doesn't apply, but then we spend all our time kind of on trunk looking at long plank holds and different bits and bobs like that where we are using those methods and i think it's uh, it's just important to highlight that we're all using isometrics in some way um and it's how we're then thinking about progressing and regressing those exercises within what you've just talked about which is fantastic um i think the other piece here is like one of the areas that we really like to try and use isometrics is for that uh, taper period and i know uh, if we're looking at that potentiation and the research that's been done around that and the understanding that we have that well if we can get somebody to max lift or lift very close to their threshold close to their fight date then we're likely to have an increase in force output during the fight um, but the barriers that you have to try and achieve get a boxer to do a, a 1 RM, RM max lift on the day of their fight compared to doing an isometric hold in prep for their fight are two different, completely different battles. Um, and we like to use the isometric pieces like a lead in to be able to get the benefits of potentiation whilst um, kind of also balancing the, the process of trying to work together with the athlete and coach to do things that um, they're comfortable with doing. Um, Another area we use uh, the isometrics with our guys is uh, in rehab. So we use a lot of uh, yielding isometrics in rehab, but we've also started using some more overcoming isometrics in really weak positions. Um, so the thing that bumped into my head was a posterior cuff piece. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with posterior cuff around this kind of more isolated approach to isometrics that we've started to see really good benefits from that are starting to stop our athletes or starting to stop, um, starting to help our athletes reduce those kind of ongoing shoulder niggles that seem to be prevalent all the time. Um, and then thinking about the same piece as, as you've talked about with the, the technical feedback using isometrics. So the opportunity, not just to potentiate the movement, but also put them in compromised positions and, try and train those train into a well cued position um, whilst applying force and we do that quite a bit with like a straight bar deadlift so we find like with quite a few of our guys they're struggling to get down to a straight bar without some kind of compensation pattern um, but we'll, when we cue them with a heavy heavy deadlift so they've got too much load on the bar they're never going to shift it um, cue them to pull themselves into a good position once they understand what that good position is, it works as a really effective way to almost um, battle against the internal loading. Um, and I think internal loading is something that's quite often like overlooked in terms of we've got muscles that are tight, um, but those muscles that are tight also apply force against the, the antagonist muscle group that we're working against. And we can use that force to be able to train into better positions. So something like a... Uh, like a seated thoracic rotation, you're doing exactly that. And I think um, we utilize it in warm-ups around those positions and trying to make sure that um, if an athlete has a limitation in terms of range or tightness, that we can kind of perhaps use isometric holds at end of range 
um, to try and work into that, uh, work into developing range in those areas. Um, and then the other piece I was just going to mention was um, we've got a few examples down at the moment where we're looking to use this time to get hypertrophy, um, whether it's functional or non-functional at the moment. We've almost split our program into neural adaptation and mechanical adaptation in terms of what we're trying to get from, from certain boxes. Now, we've got a few guys that float around walk around at fight weight and probably end up fighting at maybe two kilos below their category. Um, because the categories are so broad, if you look at like a, an amateur women, like they go from 60 to 69 and we've got two 69 women who are floating in around fight weight at 67. Now with those girls, if we can take the opportunity now to get some hypertrophy response, we'll definitely do that because um, in theory, if we get another training block off the back of this, we should be able to make that efficient and effective mass. Um, but for then for some other guys who really struggle to make weight, particularly the ones that perhaps have, we've had this category drop from 64 to 63, and it's put a little bit more of a squeeze on some of our boys. Um, we're twisting the program a little bit more so that they're working on overcoming isometrics. Um, trying to get that bit more neural drive, neural adaptation, as Dan's just talked about really eloquently, um, to all, to kind of support them and be the best that they can be in the ring. Um, so we're just playing it, um, playing the theory behind the isometrics to try and achieve those individual goals for certain boxes. Yeah, nice one, Guy. Uh, it, covered, it covered so much there. Yeah, um, the ramble. Talk, uh, no, no, brilliant, brilliant. Um, you know, talk about that muscular hypertrophy. Obviously, there is going to be some athletes that do have the time and the opportunity to take advantage of it. Um, I'm probably talking about kind of my athletes and where they're they're probably you know maxing out at their weight category. Um, you know, I've got um, you know many many different athletes that are like you know for that you know, they're going to be big for the weight and they're not kind of under um, their weight category. Um, also got like Callum Beardo that I don't want him to put on any kind of muscle whatsoever because he's got the legs the size of a tree. Um, that's just his calves, never mind his quads. So, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like kind of talking from that aspect, but I can definitely agree with you. Um, you know, you have so many different athletes that will be, so close to the weight where putting on an extra kilo or something like that in muscle mass will be uh, beneficial to them. I like what you're saying about the, the posterior cuff working uh, and working them kind of in ranges to increase mobility and activation of muscle groups that are hard to activate. Um, I found that like that particularly with the core work, when you're doing like kind of pull off press or something like that, where they're working against a band sometimes it can start feeling in the shoulders or they're not creating as much resistance to feel it directly in the core but as soon as i put on that manual resistance they feel it so much in that and um to to then get them like maybe even from a from a strength training perspective and also from muscle mass perspective um you know we're looking to try and retain as much muscle mass as possible um in in their core um for when they're making weight, because we know from our research is that trunk mass has direct correlation to punch force. So we want to try and retain muscle mass there. So I think, I think it's, you know, isometrics is such a massive area. We talked mainly about overcoming isometrics, but we're also talking about like, you know, we do use it in, in plank holds and uh, as potentiating tools and maybe mobility tools as well. Um, does anybody want to come in with anything, Tommy, Dan, on that? Sort of, um, I, I, I think um, one of the words, Gary, you mentioned a lot was like potentiation. And um, one, of, one of mine and Danny's pals, um, Tim, who, who works at the University of Leeds, he, he spent some time in the States working with um, with uh, with Altis on um, with their sprinters out there. And um, he spent, spent a little bit of time with Greg Rutherford. And he, he, as his like sort of SNC work, he, it was largely like self-directed, and he, he did really like heavy power cleans, and he did um, uh, he did very very heavy step ups on on a very partial range, 
and with like 250 like 260 kilos so like more weight than than what he could handle in his in the standard step up so s- sort of like similar to isometrics in the sense that it was, it was over the concentric course he could produce and um t- tim asked him like why why do you do so much of this and he said he said like um i don't think this has any direct um transfer to making me um to making me jump further but he said what do you think it does he says i think it makes me twitchy and i think it makes me train better and then when i train better that has the potential to make me jump make me jump further and i think on this if you if you can make someone feel good and uh, like people like doing this stuff the isometrics like it makes you feel good it makes you feel solid and um, you're getting a lot of neural drive you're getting a lot of potentiation and, and especially around competition like like what, what Danny was saying in the in, in the warm-ups and stuff like that. If you're, if you're doing this stuff and making people feel good, then it's it's probably probably gonna have a lot of benefits that aren't aren't necessarily physiological as well. Yeah, hundred percent Tommy. Um you know, Kian's asked a question here. What is a, a good starting point um for like rest periods for um ISO holds with ballistic movements and we're talking about like the, the core holds going into rotational work. And if we were going to do a really strict physiological assessment, I don't know whether there'd be that much um, kind of like scientific evidence for that to improve the rotational power, but it's, it's all about that intent. So when, when they're holding and pushing against me, then next minute they've got a three kilo med ball in their hand, you'll feel naturally, you just want to drive through that movement and that's kind of what we want and create that stiffness on the catch and then drive through and then drive through that movement. So it's one, it's, it's really can go from a, a, a static hold straight into that rotational throw, might not be necessarily physiologically potentiating, but it's creating that cue to, for intent to improve that rotational power. Um, in terms of like uh, complex, uh, using it as complex training or contrast training, I would say still stick to around about um, three to four minutes rest. But again, try and trial and error, see we're getting that feedback from the athlete. If they're jumping higher, it's working well. If they're jumping lower than what they know what they normally were, um, obviously like make that rest a little bit longer. But I'd say with uh, I normally like try and go a little bit longer when I'm doing maximal lifts, but I don't find it as um, as fatiguing as what a maximum strength would, uh, movement would be. So if I'm going to pair up a trap bar deadlift and a trap bar jump, I'd make sure that they were um, a good four minutes between them and, and I'd do all the trap bar deadlifts at once, rest uh, four minutes and then I'd do the, the trap bar jumps after that and make it separate whereas like for an isometric exercise I'd, I'd be more tempted to pair them up as a complex so you do the isometric exercise rest for three minutes and then do the the jumping exercise and then when I've been doing the the towel uh, lifts I've been doing like one to two minutes because I know that I'm not going to be uh, performing maximal force production Um as much as I would do if I were in the gym. So I've, I've kind of reduced that rest time because I haven't needed it as much. Um, I throw a random curveball in there as well, Dan, I've just thought. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we haven't really spoke about but that links really closely to Tommy's presentation from a week or two ago is the, the, the tendons adaptation to isometrics and the connective tissue adaptation to isometrics, um, which I think is actually like a really massive part of... Um, the training process using ISOs it's like because we're getting neural drive we're not getting too much mechanical um, fatigue um, where we are stressing the tissue is a, across the tendon um, and I think that's really useful from a, from an RSI point of view if we're trying to train particularly kind of our ability to reduce that contact time that Tommy was talking about or apply force to the ground really quickly um, being able to train the tendon and the, the non, like the connective tissue, the non-contractile portions of the mus- muscular tendinous unit is really key. Okay. Um, Tom Smith, you've uh, 
had a little bit of a mention about um, what Tommy's been saying about Alex and Tara's work. Do you want to come in and explain a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I watched his presentation on the um, on the Strength Coach Network, the uh, Alex and Tara's one, which is really, really good. But one of the things that he does talk about is sort of hidden asymmetries that the isometrics will, isometric exercises and testing will show. So a counter movement jump or, or a traditional sort of back squat might not show those, but when it came into sort of isometric mid thigh pull tests and his calf isometrics and knee dominant isometrics, quite large asymmetry side to side. So and that's kind of his rationale for them all being single leg exercises is that, that we can, you know, the, you know, almost take that out of it, which was good. And he talks quite heavily, like Gary was saying as well, about the tendon adaptions, which is another really key um, you know, uh, reason behind using them, I think. Um, just on the topic of it, how I've kind of programmed them over this time with some of my more advanced athletes is, is trying to give them that strength stimulus through isometrics, um, especially if they lift heavy weights already, quite hard to replicate that without obviously having access to them. So that's kind of how I've looked to program them within this time. That's cool. Yeah, we had a decent chat on Friday with some points that could link to that. To be fair, like with what you were saying about the um, the pogos and when we spoke about the like the unilateral stuff. Yeah, um, the, I, I think um, a lot of the the unilateral um, so some of the unilateral research, like I've I've not looked into it as much as I'd like, but um, sort of um, saying that the sort of magn the magnitude and direction of um, of the the fluctuations between left and right can be very very different. So, if you, for example, if you're looking like a, a triple hot, like day to day, someone might do really well on the left foot, and then another day they might do really well on the, the right foot. But um, one of the things it's I think it's been found to be a lot more consistent in is the is the isometrics, and the sort of like rationale behind that is that it's less sort of skill based, and um, there's like less coordination required to just pushing push into something as hard as you can on your left leg and your right leg. But um, something like single leg pogos, if you're if you're looking at that, um, so doing 10 pogos on your left leg and looking at the RSI and then doing 10 on your right, you might you might find it like um, the the magnitude and direction of the of the different um, of the different asymmetries varies from, a lot from day to day. But um, one of my pals Matt um, he, he he's looked looked quite a lot into a, asymmetries and he, he I, I, w I was worried about a player that I was working with because they had quite a big difference between the left and right on a Nordic hamstring. And he said, look, I wouldn't worry about it too much because um, it, the, the magnitude varies from day to day. There, there is probably an imbalance, but he said, also, if both sides are strong, then you probably don't need to worry about an imbalance too much, which was quite interesting. So I suppose in the context of that, if someone was strong on both sides bilaterally, would it be too much of a problem if they were um, if they were imbalanced between left and right? Which yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like um, I've, I've, yeah. I've got a solemn clue, really. But uh, Tom, Chris Bishop's the one to look for on that. He's got some good research. He's done his PhD. Yeah, on that. That's it, isn't it? He, um, I think, the end findings were even with noticeable asymmetries, it didn't actually affect outcomes. If that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah. But, but have a have a little look. And in regards to your guy, maybe at yeah. home doing some form of accentuated eccentric or single leg hamstring curl might be a way a way to program that guy if he does have a noticeable yeah. asymmetry between limbs. Yeah, yeah definitely. What's oh, your how, many, how many friends have you got, Tommy? You, you've got loads. <laughs> I've, only, like, have I've, ni I've, nicked, I've nicked your pals. It's like, <laughs> it's like, since when have you had other friends beside us? <laughs> well, um... Dan Jefferson has asked about uh, triphasic training. What are people's thoughts on it? Um, obviously, you know this is this is going around. Um, I haven't really worked with it. I don't know whether anybody else has. Dan, Gary, have you worked with triphasic training? Not in the way that it's defined in that question, really. Um, I mean, it's, it's to my understanding, it's just another approach to block periodization, isn't it? Yeah, you do two weeks eccentric, two weeks isometric, two weeks concentric, mm. and then you go into your training block. So with some of our guys at the moment, we're doing like a three-week uh, isometric, three-week 
like, well, let me use the terms from before, like a three week neural phase and a three week um, mechanical phase. So we're going like isometrics for a couple of weeks and then flipping it to as many reps as possible um, in sets. And so I can answer that in about six weeks time when we've gone through that block and we see how it would work. Yeah. I haven't really experimented uh, with it myself. I kind of like to stick to that. Try, trying to keep it basic really because it's worked block periodization has worked for for many years and it's worked with myself so um, work with my athletes as well so like kind of working working on max strength strength speed working through to towards the taper and then working different variations of that as well uh dan have you got uh, any kind of thoughts or comments again i think it goes back to the specific athletes training age and what type of stimulus and stressor we can expose them to obviously cow deets is the main dude in regards to triphasic training um in the us and i'd say his athletes have a pretty, pretty high training age so he's having to you know think outside the box so to speak to elicit positive adaptations um i think if we go through an extended eccentric block with our boxers i'm sure well i think gary and, and yourself may agree with the with the guys you work with you know like that eccentric muscle damage when in camp, when sparring, especially for Gary's guys, the amateur, you know, the quick turnaround in fights, if they're sore, they're, they're never going to want to talk to you again, let alone strength train again. So I think we just need to be kind of smart with that. Um, I think now's a good time, actually. You know, Tommy just expressed, you know, Nordics there. Um, even with the footballers, a, a small amount of footballers I may work with, um, you know, doing them in season is pretty hard. You know, we microdose them at the best of time just to kind of top it up because, again, we don't want them sore. And we need to program the, you know, I call Nordic, um, obviously it's an eccentric, but it's kind of a quasi-isometric if they've got sufficient strength to control through that range as well. Um, so then doing max velocity sprint in the day after that wouldn't probably be the optimal strategy. Um, so now's the time we can maybe program stuff like that. But again, it all depends on the athlete. So great question, Dan. From my side personally, with the guys I work with and, you know, work with some pretty elite pro boxers, but it doesn't mean they're elite in the, in the weights room, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. And like you're saying about that eccentric stress, the stress. Whenever I've made an athlete sore, and then they've sparred next day, I've had a phone call from coach, and I haven't even done anything that bad with them. Yeah. So imagine like doing like a, a very intense eccentric program where you're going to get that muscle soreness. Like doing doing something as like simple as a reverse lunge, doing it with a safety. Oh, I've seen a massive difference in like how sore they are the next day just mm -hmm. by increasing that load just a little bit and just not having the dumbbell there mm -hmm. they end up being quite sore from it so I'm very very cautious of doing like kind of like anything eccentric but like I say it's it could be a good time to be able to do it I think what what Gary's alluded to there work on neural adaptation doing that as a block and then working on some mechanical adaptations as well and making sure that you've got enough time to do that just on the, the soreness piece as well, it's, a, it's like a really interesting challenge with our guys because there's a couple of different layers to it in, in GB. Um, with Not just with the quick turnaround in fights, but also the different stages that everybody's at in their fight, fight schedule. Um, it's almost a duty of care to make sure that when they're sparring each other, they've got like a similar level of soreness. Um, because otherwise, like if one of them's really fresh and the other one's really sore, it becomes almost a, a health risk. Um, and I think there's a there is an element of duty of care in terms of the periodization, um, as as like silly as that may be. I think it's a, a unique part of like boxing, particular amateur boxing that that S and C coaches need to really have a good handle on. Um, and then I'd be really interested to know if uh, like Dan Jefferson's got any thoughts from based on his question. Like uh, he's obviously kind of dug into the triphasic training a little bit more, and it'd be really cool to hear whether he's got any thoughts on what's just been said. Hi, Gary. Hi. Yes, uh, me personally, I've not really, I've not tried any of the tri basic. I was just really um, going based on some of the things I've seen online um, with some of the guys in America that, that actually work with some of the guys work with combat sports um, and, and use this type of training. And I, I was a bit confused in terms of, you know, the muscle damage that will be caused by. Uh, a block of eccentric training and like a, 
I'm getting an idea that these guys are still training, still sparring, and um, some of the mixed martial arts guys. So yeah, I just wondered what what people's thoughts were on it. Um, it's not really a, it's not an approach I've I've taken to be honest. I just wondered. The, I guess just without knowing any more depth, like the logic piece that I draw down there is like what I've just explained. I guess if if an entire training squad are all feeling stiff and sore and they're all trying to work in that same kind of um, state, then it becomes a little bit more manageable from a, from a technical coaching point of view. Um, but that's kind of a really spurious little logic piece that I've put together there. So um, just what, what I would be thinking if they're using it on a, on a larger scale. I think um, on that as well. Oh, sorry, Gary. No, sorry. Don't carry on. Yeah. I think on that as well, I'm not going to completely debunk and say, no, the triphasic isn't worth it for boxing at all. You can go through an eccentric phase early on um, when sparring volumes aren't high. You know, we get the luxury at times where we're balancing, obviously, when sparring gets introduced in terms of frequency and volume. So the main thing, as Danny said there, was about a boxing coach saying to him, oh, you're my guy's score, you know, what he's calling you up saying, what are you doing is keep the main thing the main thing and we all know we add to the main thing okay we aren't the main thing um so, so the main thing being the sparring so maybe we can do an eccentric block um i think you said it was a two-week block there dan um prior to the boxing volumes increasing but again it's not something that i personally played around with you know we do use eccentric work but we don't solely go through eccentric work because honestly knowing the boxers knowing the fighters they just won't want to come back yeah i think uh, just um, what Dan just said at the end then, like knowing the boxes that they, they're they not going to want to come back. I think that's like really key. I think if you put it in and trial it at the wrong time and then your your fighter ends up being sore in sparring and not being able to perform to the best of his ability, you're almost going to lose the trust a little bit. And I think once you've lost that trust with your athlete, it's very, very hard to, to get it back and your whole program is kind of a little bit thrown out the window. Um, so I would say... I personally used it training for a fight once, halfway through camp. I just wanted to see what it was like, and it was terrible. I couldn't do any of my runs, couldn't spar properly, so personally, I wouldn't use it. If I was going to use it, I would do it um, sort of what you, I guess you would call it like the off-season in between camps if they're ticking over. Maybe then is a good time to uh, put it in just because, obviously, they're not going to be sparring. Boxing sessions are down a little bit. It's more technical as well, so that would probably be the best time um, to use it, but having experienced it personally, I, I definitely wouldn't do it during the sort of main 10, 10 weeks of camp. Reese, I'll touch on that as well. From your experience with your guys, is adherence to the program when you say maybe potentially making that intervention out of camp. I'm telling you now, none of my guys are going to be doing eccentric work by themselves, bud. <laughs> no, most, de most definitely not. Like, even from personal experience, when you, when you program it for yourself and you're like right I'm going to do a three second eccentric four reps in you're thinking I'll just do two seconds now just do one second you know what? I'm just going to do normal reps now so yeah you're completely right it's something that they may say if you do give it to them out of camp um, but it's definitely something you're going to have to be there for a solid proof I think just uh, yeah, absolutely. just from drawing on experience outside of like boxing for um, one of our squash athletes that we work with at the EIS um, we put him through, and he's a diligent guy, really well trained, um, and he's the type of mentality that's kind of the flip reverse of what we've just discussed. Whereas, if he's feeling sore, he loves it and he'll go for it. Um, and uh, if for any of you guys that have worked with any squash athletes in the past, like squash, they're absolutely lower body beasts. Um, now this guy was like worked through a four week block of eccentric only. We did three sessions a week of eccentric training um, and that's his only like strength stimulus. Um, now he, yeah, he felt crap through it. He got a bit, he got a lot of his court work done anyway, but wasn't feeling snappy. wasn't feeling sharp as you'd expect, but um, off the back of that block then felt like a whole different man. Right, and it felt like he took a, a whole different level um, up. So it's one of those where if you can get the buy-in, if you can periodize it effectively and you can work together with the entire team to be able to justify its place, um, it could be a way to be able to like get a really strong physical benefit in a very short time. Um, 
but it's like whether whether the juice is worth a squeeze in the end. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everything has everything has a place, and then you've got to think about what reward you get from it. Um, the big thing that I always say is that strength training is probably a lowly fifth on the list. I don't, I've, I've said it. I've, I've actually gone through it quite a few times, but I forgot where it actually does place so in list of priorities. If you think about uh, a boxer's preparation, the the first one is probably sparring. Second one's making weight, then it's pad work, then it's bag work, then it's your running intervals, and then it's probably uh, then it's probably your strength work, and probably could put mobility and recovery ahead of that strength work as well. Um, so even though we're talking about all this, we're trying to optimise adaptations, we're trying to optimise their performance as best as we can. We've also got to know the role of strength training. Um, try and find the best way to help optimize performance without affecting the other areas. Like, like Reese was saying, it felt like he couldn't do his runs. Running, running and your conditioning is going to be more important to a boxer. So if they can't feel like they're being able to push their body and be able to run as fast to be able to push their body because you've made the legs sore and heavy, not going to buy into, in, into strength training. But if you're going to be doing strength training, which is making them feel faster and more explosive, being able to work through the gears and then you're going to get them uh, to buy in. So um, does anybody want to talk about anything else or shall we uh, finish it there? I feel, feel like we could go on all day really. It's been good now and for It's been the longest session and I think that you know some of the conversations and everything have been fantastic. So I'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining in. Everyone who's contributed, Gary, Tommy, Dan, Reese, Tom, Dan, all contributing well, all your questions as well. And those that are uh, tuning in, uh, supporting these webinars, appreciate it. And it's kind of keeping me sane as well. I'm, in, I'm enjoying, I'm actually looking forward to these sessions every Monday. Um, if, side of that, Dan, I think from the audience, like it's really useful to hear it and really useful to have somebody coordinating stuff like this. So just appreciate that, mate, and keep it up. Yeah, cheers, Gary. Um, if anybody wants to have a go at presenting um, or want us to um, cover any certain area, you know, it got to Saturday this week, and I was thinking, what am I going to present on mon on Monday? Tommy says isometrics, and I'm like, great, I've got to do a full, full new presentation on that. So <laughs> let's uh, let's try and get the um, let's try and get some subjects going in the group, so I don't have to do all the presentation on on uh, on Sunday afternoon. Um, so you know, and if anybody wants to have a go at presenting or stuff that they want to cover, uh, just pop it in the chat or talk to me directly, and uh, we'll get you up onto the Zoom dance floor. Okay, so everybody have a uh, have a good day, have a good week, and I'm sure I'll catch you before next Monday. But if not, I'll see you uh, next Monday. Thanks very much, Danny. Cheers. 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 See you later. Cheers, Ben. Cheers, everyone.